Welcome back. In the last video, I covered the quote-unquote basics of WebGL, a fairly minimal amount of ideas and code to get started using the API, a uh, fairly minimal still being a lot of code. That's all well and good, but in my experience, it can be tricky to take the theory and apply it to something that you can actually use. As silly as it might sound, just drawing two triangles is something that I struggled with when I was learning, and I know I'm not alone on that. In this video, I'll mostly be using those same core ideas, but to generate something much more exciting, this little demo here, which spawns a bunch of different shapes and explodes them outwards in slightly curved paths in a truly Windows 95 screensaver sort of way. I think this is a good enough example to give you what you need to make a small little shape-based game if you'd like, but simple enough to fit into a single video. As a quick disclaimer, I will not be covering two WebGL concepts that could be very helpful here, namely hardware instancing and uniform buffer objects. The topics don't really fit in with the series I want to make, but I am thinking about covering them in much smaller videos. Let me know if you're interested in the comments. Let's look at uniform values, which is the first new WebGL idea I want to cover in this video. You can think of these as shader inputs or as configuration variables. In the last video, I used the vertex shader shown on the screen. When provided a triangle with the following vertices, labeled A, B, and C, the resulting triangle looked something like this. I can update the shader to include uniforms, which are placed in the same top-level scope as input attributes and have the same basic GLSL types. From application code, uniforms are set before a draw call and remain the same for each input vertex. This new shader makes two transformations on the input vertex data, first scaling or resizing the input, and second translating or moving the scaled input into a new position. I then use the scaled and translated value in the final GL position output. You can think of the vertex input, here named a position as an attribute position, as a coordinate in model space, and the transformation as a way of finding the corresponding clip space coordinate. Ultimately, the job of the vertex shader is to calculate the clip space coordinate, and uniforms give us the ability to define transformations that are applied uniformly across each vertex. I don't know if that's where the name comes from, but it's a fair enough way to think about what it means to be a uniform. By changing these uniform values, I can resize and move this triangle around the viewport without updating the triangle definition itself. For an individual triangle, the benefit might seem small, but for a large object with thousands of vertices, this is much better than updating and uploading large chunks of data every frame just to move anything around. Okay, so by changing the vertex shader, we can move geometry around the screen for the movement part of this demo, but what are the color in movement and color? The fragment shader in the last video simply outputs indigo. Remember, this shader is invoked for every pixel that is part of a triangle, as decided by the rasterizer, and in this case, just colored indigo. Here's an updated vertex and fragment shader, where the vertex shader now includes an additional attribute called vertex color. I'll label vertices A, B, and C as having the colors red, green, and blue, respectively. There's also an output variable called fragment color, which corresponds with a new fragment shader input variable with the same name and vec3 type. This input fragment color is then used in the new fragment shader output color. The result is a triangle with colors that blends between red, green, and blue. For each pixel the rasterizer passes to the fragment shader, it also interpolates vertex shader outputs into the matching fragment shader inputs. I've included a possible algorithm for computing this value, but this happens behind the scenes in the rasterizer stage. You just need to know that the values are smoothly blended across the triangle surface and given as fragment shader inputs for each pixel. We'll be using this a lot more and in pretty fancy ways when we talk about 3D lighting models, so take an extra moment to really wrap your head around this idea of blending vertex properties across all the pixels on a surface. The final new idea I want to cover is that of a vertex array object, which is basically just a snapshot of input assembler state. To make our movement and color demo app, we'll need to pass in both color and position information as vertex attributes for several different shapes and colors. To do that with what we already know, you'd write some code like this. Bind each buffer, update the associated attribute, make a draw call, and then repeat the whole process for each unique colored shape. This is all well and good, but it does make for some fairly nasty and error-prone code. Enter the vertex array object, which you can think of as a full input assembler state. This is one of the places where WebGL hides some weird driver behavior. A vertex array object might sound like an unnecessary level of abstraction, but it actually allows graphics drivers to behave more efficiently and requires fewer state updates. It'll also be easier for you to learn modern OpenGL, Vulkan, or WebGPU down the road if you understand and use VAOs, since those APIs use similar constructs. 
Now, to draw an object that has attribute state captured in a VAO, you simply need to bind the VAO again and issue the draw call. That's it. Binding the VAO binds the entire set of attributes it contains. Our code is simpler, and it plays more nicely with the hardware. Wins all around. For the rest of the tutorials in this series, I'll be using TypeScript. You'll mostly be able to follow along in plain JavaScript, but I'd highly suggest using TypeScript anyways. All of the demos we write for the rest of the series will involve writing simulation logic, and TypeScript helps catch common issues early. I'll be installing TypeScript through NPM. We'll be using NPM to install a 3D math library for future videos in the series as well, so I suggest downloading it if you don't already have it. Again, you can follow along without it, it'll just be a bit of work. The quote-unquote proper way to install NPM is through a version manager like NVM, but it's a bit easier to just go to the Node.js website and use the easy installer for the most recent version. Up to you. Installing is easier this way, but updating Node and NPM is easier with a version manager. Because we're using NPM and TypeScript, we need to set up the project first. NPM uses a package.json file to help manage dependencies. This is the file I'm using. To install project dependencies, TypeScript, run npm install, which downloads dependencies to a node modules folder. Very basic, bare bones. The TypeScript configuration I'm using, here in tsconfig.json, is also pretty simple. We have one source file, and we want to use all the basic TypeScript checks, which we specify with this strict setting. The index.html file I'm using is the same as in the last video, but I've updated the title element up above and the script source down below. This JavaScript file will be generated by the TypeScript compiler from movementandcolor.ts. To make sure everything is set up right, I'll first bring in that helpful show error function from the last video. You can see that TypeScript has caught two problems. The first is that error text parameter doesn't have any type information, which breaks the no implicit any rule implied by strict mode. We'll be passing in strings, so I'll annotate this as a string. I put in another error here. I'm adding error text to the error section instead of the HTML error element variable. And finally, TypeScript notices that error box div could be null. This will happen if there's no error box HTML element. I'll add in a null check up here, and the error goes away. TypeScript has a fantastic type narrowing system. It knows that because the function exits up here if error box div is null, down here, it must not be null. I'll move the console.error call to the top as well, just in case. And now we have a much less buggy show error method. I'm not going to spend a lot of time focusing on TypeScript specific features from here on out, but I did want to highlight why I'm bringing it into my videos going forward. To compile this file, run npm run build in the console. You can see that the TypeScript compiler has started in watch mode and generated a movement in color JavaScript file. Everything looks good. If I load the HTML page, well, nothing is apparently broken, but it's also not doing anything. I'll put in the absolutely classic hello world. You can see when I save, TypeScript reruns automatically, and the web page is appropriately updated. Cool. On to the actual WebGL stuff now. I'm going to start off by basically copying over the code from the last tutorial. And of course, there's a couple things that TypeScript doesn't like in this code. I'll fix them one by one. The first is that TypeScript isn't sure that this canvas reference is an HTML canvas element, so I'll add a narrowing check here to fix that. A few of these WebGL calls can technically return null, for example, if the user runs out of GPU memory or something. I'll add in some null checks, display an error, and exit the demo. This narrows the types down to non-null types and makes the errors go away. Finally, I'll rename this function movement in color and save. Not a lot of changes considering we have TypeScript set to be really strict. Refreshing the page, we see the output from the last video as expected. Neat! One question I've been asked quite about in my tutorial videos is how to draw two shapes. When I was following along with DirectX tutorials way back when, that's one of the things that confused me too, so let's do that now. First, we'll add in the vertex shader uniform values that I talked about earlier. One for where to place each triangle, and the other for how big that triangle should be, both measured in pixels. Cool. So now we can decide where to put this vertex in pixels across the canvas by multiplying the vertex position by the size of the triangle in pixels, and adding the location of the triangle in pixels. I've been saying in pixels a lot. We do need one more value to convert from canvas pixel coordinates into clip space coordinates. 
We do this by taking the size of the canvas in pixels and dividing our final pixel vertex position by that canvas size. This gives us a percentage from 0 to 1 across the canvas that this vertex should be drawn at. But remember, clip space expects a number from negative 1 to 1. To convert from percentages to clip space, we multiply the percentage by 2 to get us a number from 0 to 2, and subtract 1 to give us a number in the range negative 1 to 1 in each dimension. If I refresh the page, you see a black screen. The default values for these uniforms is 0, so the triangle has a size of 0 and isn't drawn. We'll have to update the application logic a bit too. Let's look down here next to getting our attribute locations. We'll also need uniform locations to set uniform values. I'll get the locations of our three uniforms right after the attribute code, like this. These calls can fail too if there's no uniform with a given name, so I'll need to check if the uniform values are null. I'll introduce a typo here to make sure my error works. It does, excellent. And now I can set these uniform values in our rendering logic. I'll pick this spot right here after setting the vertex shader inputs to the triangle vertices, but before running the draw call. We can put this anywhere between activating the program and running the draw call, but like with the other pipeline configuration, it just needs to be set at some point. First, we set the shader uniform values to the size of the canvas in pixels with a gl.uniform2f call. 2 is the number of components and f stands for float, floating point values. To draw our two triangles, we'll make two draw calls. I'll just copy paste the first, they both use the same buffer and shader, which was set earlier in the function. I'll need to set the location and size uniform values for each before drawing them. For the first one, let's make it, say, you know, I don't know, how big is the canvas? 800 by 800? Let's make the first one 200 pixels big and the second one 400 pixels big. Now, where to put them? I guess I want a bit of a gap on the left, so maybe x equals 300 and y equals 400 to put it in the middle of the screen vertically. For the second one, it's bigger. You know what, I'll make it 100 pixels instead. I'll put it mostly to the right of the screen, 650 pixels to give it a little bit of a margin to the right, and a touch further down at y equals 300 pixels. Refreshing the page, you see two triangles, one big and one small. The small one shifted a bit downwards vertically. I'm going to change the vertex values to be twice as big, since we're not defining them in clip space anymore. I'll refresh the page, and you see the triangles got twice as big. And I guess I'll play around with the uniform values again to get this one to touch the top edge of the canvas. Okay, so we have everything we need to draw multiple shapes. Later on, we'll do an only slightly more fancy version of this to get the explodey, curvy motion of the final demo, but first let's get the shape color sorted. To do that, we'll need to add the fragment shader input to decide each pixel's color, and for that, we'll need an additional vertex color attribute. First off, I'm going to clean things up a bit. I'll move the triangle vertex information to a constant outside of the demo function. It still works, great. And now I'll add two sets of colors for our triangles, one with the primary colors and the other with a nice fiery red-orange gradient. I mentioned reading float attributes from integer data in the last video, and this is a great place to show that off. For low dynamic range rendering like this, most displays use only 8 bits per color channel, so it doesn't make sense to define colors using 32 bits of float. We can use 8-bit unsigned integers, which can store a whole number from 0 to 255, and load them into our color attribute as a value normalized between 0 and 1. We could also do this for position, technically, but we'll just stick to color. It'll look pretty familiar if you've done anything with computer colors before. For the RGB triangle, I'll set the three vertices to have colors of full red, full green, and full blue. And for the fiery triangle, I'll use the colors I picked off screen by converting hex codes I found into decimal color values. I've left comments with the colors I picked. For these position and color arrays, we might as well build the typed float32 and uint8 arrays in the definitions, no point in doing two separate steps like in the last video. Down below, I'll update the position buffer code and do the same thing for both of our color buffers as well. The new buffers are now in place, let's update the shaders. First, I'll update the fragment shader to take in a new input value called fragment color, and use that value for the final output color instead of the solid indigo from the last video. To get this fragment color, we need to provide it as a vertex shader output. Use the same type and name as in the vertex shader, but as an out value. We also have to pass a new vertex attribute, vertex color. I'll add that next to our existing position attribute. We pass this input color right along to the output color without doing any processing on it. 
Going back to our demo, the triangles are black now. Once again, default values when things aren't wired up right is zero, so this color attribute is just all zero solid black. Since we're here, I'm going to introduce a typo into our vertex shader so that the vertex shader output and fragment shader input don't match anymore. Refreshing our demo, whoops, I need that typo everywhere this variable is used. Now refreshing the page, you see a link stage error. Linking a program checks that all fragment shader inputs are covered by vertex shader outputs, and by default it matches them by name and type. With the shader code finished, I'll add in a new attribute location variable in the type script code next to the position attribute code, and make sure that we get a valid attribute location for it. I'll add a typo to test the error message. Looks great. Without the typo, even more great. Moving down to the rendering logic, here's where we set the position attribute from the last tutorial. Each triangle will have a different color attribute input, so I'll set the input for the first triangle here and the second triangle down here. Bind the buffer, set the vertex attribute pointer, use the triangle color attribute for index, three components per vector. Remember, the type in the third parameter is the type of the input data, in our case, gl unsigned byte, which is the same as the uint8 type. Normalized is that fun property that converts from integers between 0 and 255 to floats between 0 and 1, set it to true here, and I'll just use zeros for the last two values to tell WebGL to figure out attribute size and spacing by itself. Refreshing the code here, you'll see it doesn't work. I missed a step. We also need to enable the new vertex attribute so that WebGL doesn't pass in the default zeros. I still have no idea why this is necessary, but for some reason it is. I always forget to add this. Now refreshing the page, we see the two RGB triangles with their nice color gradients. With that working, I'll do the same color attribute setting for the fiery triangle colors. And now the second triangle uses those new colors. The third and final new WebGL idea for this video is vertex array objects, or VAOs. To use them, we mostly just have to shuffle around existing code a bit, so we might as well clean up some other things while we're at it. This is a good example. We have the same buffer code copy-pasted three times. By the end of this video, we'll use eight buffers, so we should isolate all this duplicated stuff a bit better. I'll make a create static vertex buffer method that takes in a GL context and the data to be uploaded. Now, array buffer is the general representation of all JavaScript typed arrays. That's uint8 array, float32 array, and all the others. Creating a static vertex buffer is a really common thing to do, so we'll be copying this helper around in future tutorials as well. Moving back down to our demo function, let's replace these nine lines of code with three create static vertex buffer calls for each chunk of vertex data we want uploaded to the GPU. Everything still works? Great. I'll write a similar method for creating a vertex array object from a position and color buffer. This function won't be as generally useful for future videos as the create static vertex buffer might be, but it's long and repeated code, so we might as well isolate it. A uh, quick note, it's not a bad idea to first write the bind vertex ray call, then write a matching bind vertex ray call to clear the bound array object, before finally writing the actual attribute setup code in the middle. It's so, so, so easy to accidentally corrupt one of these. I was stuck fixing bugs for two days on the text version of this tutorial for my website, and all the bugs ended up being related to accidentally overriding global state on things like bound VAOs. It serves me right for being lazy with them, I guess, and it's another point to web GPU and its lack of global state. Cool. With the VAO bound, we enable both vertex attributes we want to use, bind the buffer and set the attribute pointer for position, then do the same for color, before unbinding and returning the VAO. With that written, let's go back down to our buffer code and create our two VAOs. We should have been doing this before, first I'll check to make sure the buffers aren't null, and with that done, I'll make a VAO for both the RGB triangle and the fiery triangle. Hmm, I'm missing the attribute locations, we set up the buffers before we set up the shaders. We'll need to do a bit more refactoring. First, I'm going to pull out the vertex shader source code outside of the demo function, and then do the same for the fragment shader source. Okay, now I'll move the RGB VAO creation down here after... Oh, I mean down here, after the attribute uniform code. Much better. I'll do the same for the fiery triangle VAO, add in some null checks, and add an error message. With the heavy attribute binding done in the VAO setup, the rendering code can be cleaned up a lot. We no longer need to enable attributes here, that's kept in the VAO, 
and we can completely get rid of all the bind buffer and GL attribute pointer calls, replacing them with a single GL bind vertex array call for the piece of geometry we want to draw. Save, reload, and oh, that's a problem. After a bit of hunting, it looks like the bug is down here. I found out the issue while scripting out the voiceovers for this video. It turns out TypeScript type declarations for WebGL buffer is really screwy and basically matches any object type in JavaScript. I'm not sure why it was done this way. Normally TypeScript is really great at preventing exactly this kind of problem, but it's certainly not perfect. Back to the video. Refreshing the page again, that's more like it. We have our same objects being drawn, but with a bit simpler setup and much simpler rendering logic. So this code right here is all well and good for rendering an image, but we want to make an animation of shapes flying everywhere. Fundamentally, an animation is a series of images all shown one after another very, very quickly. With a video like the one you're watching right now, these images have been generated ahead of time, but with WebGL, these images are instead generated on the fly in response to whatever's happening in your application. Browsers expose a nice JavaScript method for calling a piece of code as soon as the monitor is ready for a new image, the requestAnimationFrame function. First, I'm going to create a new function that does all the rendering stuff and call it frame. Doesn't matter what you call it, frame is good. I'm going to put in two request animation calls, one right after defining this function, and another at the bottom of the frame function itself. The bottom request animation frame call will tell the browser to call this frame function as soon as it's ready to show something to the screen, and the request animation frame call inside the frame function will tell it to do the same thing, but as soon as all the rendering code to draw an image has finished running. Pulling up the output, it looks the same. This is an animation, but things aren't moving around at all. My browser is now frantically drawing this same image 60 times per second. We're going to have to make our rendering logic change each time in order to get any sort of actual animation. I'm going to introduce a new moving shape class up here, which keeps track of the position, velocity, and size of a moving shape, as well as a reference to the vertex array object that should be used to draw it. I'll add an update method here that takes in a single parameter dt. This is delta time, or the amount of time in seconds that a simulated object experiences within a simulation. Position is expressed in terms of canvas pixels, velocity is expressed in canvas pixels per second, and dt is expressed in seconds. So this is a very simple simulation that just moves the shape around at some constant speed. Coming back down here, I'll set up some variables to keep track of our moving shape simulation. I'll make a moving shape object for each triangle we have here on the canvas, using the same values from below for position and size, but I'll set a velocity of 50 pixels per second in the x dimension and 5 pixels per second in the y dimension. I'll do the same thing for the fiery triangle, but give it the exact opposite velocity. I'll come down here and replace the constants in our uniform updating calls with the relative positions of the first and second triangles, respectively. Refreshing the page, it's Still the same, but that's because we're not ever calling the update method. So how to figure out how much time has elapsed? Another nice tool that browsers give us is the performance.now function, which gives us the amount of time that has passed since... some point in time. Before going into the render loop, we take a quick note of what the last observed time is, and then each frame we look at the clock again, calculate the amount of time that's passed since the previous frame, and then reset the previously observed time to this frame's time instead. Each time frame is called, this dt value will be recalculated as the amount of time in seconds that has passed since the last frame. We'll pass this delta time into both of our triangles, which gives us this lovely animation of our two triangles moving in opposite directions. Okay, so our app is set up for animation now. It's time to build out that fancier simulation I showed at the beginning of this video. To start, instead of making two hard-coded shape objects, let's make an array of moving shape objects, holding the same shapes for now. Down here, this update section turns into updating each shape in the array, nothing crazy so far. And the per shape part of the render section also gets put in the for loop, setting the size, position, and vertex array object properties based on each individual shape. Refreshing the page, we see the same thing, but now with a list that we can add more shapes into. Back in the logic declarations, I'll add a time to next spawn value. Instead of just remembering the values I want to use everywhere, I'll make constants at the top of this file to hold the configuration I want to use for this demo. I'll set spawn rate, which is how much time should pass between creating new shapes, to 0.08 seconds.
min shape time and max shape time declare the minimum and maximum amount of time a shape can stay in the simulation. I'll pick a random number between the two for each shape we make. Uh, without this, we'll end up adding more and more shapes forever, which is a memory leak and will eventually crash our program, so we need a way to remove the shapes too. Min and max shape speed will be used in a similar way. I'll pick a random number between the two for each new shape, and that'll be how fast this shape moves in pixels per second across the canvas. Min and max shape size for the size of each new shape, and finally max shape count is a little safety feature to make sure I don't accidentally make a configuration that gets out of hand. Okay, to implement survival time, I'll add a time remaining parameter to our moving shape class. I'll also add in an isAlive method that returns true if the shape has any time remaining, and finally I'll subtract the amount of time remaining by how much time has elapsed in the update method. That done, I'll go back to the spawning logic. Initialize time to next spawn with the spawn rate variable, subtract the amount of elapsed time each frame, and while the value is negative, spawn a new shape and add the spawn time to the tracked variable. I do a while loop like this so that multiple shapes can be spawned in a single frame. Uh, if the spawn rate is higher than the frame time, this comes in handy. To spawn a new shape, I'll make a new shape and add it to our list of shapes. I need a position, velocity, size, time remaining, and VAO. I'll define all those parameters up here. But before doing that, I'll make one more helper to give us a random number in a range. Cool, back to the spawning logic. For the position, for now I'll just spawn shapes in the middle of the screen. I'll use a bit of trigonometry here to get the velocity. I'll pick both a random angle in radians and a random speed, and then find the x and y components of the velocity by using the sine and cosine of the angle multiplied by that speed. To get the size and time remaining for the shape, I'll just pick a random value in the range between the configuration values, and to pick which shape should be generated, I'll pick randomly between both of our triangle types. Add this shape to our list, and the spawning logic is done. Well, for now. Once all the shapes are updated, remember there's a time limit on each. I'll add a bit of functional JavaScript magic here. This filter returns an array containing only the shapes that are still active. And this slice call returns an array with a maximum size of 250. Refreshing the page, and things are looking a lot more lively. I'll make a couple more changes to finish up this demo. I want the spawn location to move around the canvas, and I want the shapes to move in a little bit more of a dynamic curved line instead of this straight line. Uh, and then finally, I do want to add a few more shapes, a couple colored squares and a colored circle. First off, I want to point out this 3 in the draw arrays call. For a square, we'll be drawing two triangles next to each other that form a square, so this will be 6. And for a circle, it'll be a much bigger number, probably. We'll make a circle with a whole bunch of slices, sort of like a pizza or a pie. I have this demoed on the text version of this tutorial right here. You can sort of see how triangles are arranged to make a circle that looks more and more like a circle the more triangles you use. Before we get too far into things, I'll add a num vertices parameter to the moving shape class, and set it to 3 for all the shapes we use so far. Great! Next up, we need the geometry buffers for each shape. For the positions of our square vertices, I'll make two triangles one taking the lower left portion of the square surface and the other taking the upper right portion. I'm again going to just copy and paste the color values from my notes. The way I've arranged these are the colors go from top to bottom, so that any vertex with a y equals positive 1 should have one color, and the other vertices should have the other color. The second square is easier, it's just a bunch of gray. Easy. Moving back down here, I'll upload the new square data to their own vertex buffers. and combine the square positions and colors into their own vertex ray objects. I'll make a list of geometry that we support, where each element has a VAO and a number of vertices in that VAO that should be drawn. Down in our shape spawning code, instead of picking randomly between two triangle VAOs, I'll instead pick a random geometry index. I use math.floor to get an integer value, like 0, 1, or 2, instead of something like 1.5 or 2.8. I pick the piece of geometry in our geometry list at that index, and pass the VAO and number of vertices into our new moving shape. With that done, refreshing the page, you now see some indigo gradient and solid gray squares that are jumping out. Neat! Now for the final shape, the light circle. You've probably noticed that it's an absolute pain to hard-code vertex information in like this. 
Typically, you'll get your asset data either from an art tool that can generate vertex information, or you'll generate it from some sort of mathematical pattern. Circles have this lovely pattern that makes them pretty simple to generate, so we'll generate a list of triangles for our circle shape. I'll add in another constant for the number of segments, where each of these segments will look, again, like a piece of pizza or a piece of pie. The first vertex for each triangle will be in the middle of the circle, and the second two vertices will be along the edges of the circle, some angle apart based on how many slices our app is configured to use. Notice I'm doing something a bit differently here. For the other shapes, I use two separate buffers to store the positions and colors, but in this one I'm putting the positions and colors for each vertex right next to each other inside one big list of numbers. I've also chosen to use floats instead of unsigned ints here. Technically it is possible to put uints next to floats in a binary array buffer, but it's tedious and a touch complicated so I'm not doing that here. This is called interleaving vertex data, and it's another way to organize vertex data into buffers. It's hard to say that one way of organizing vertex data is better than another, it really depends on a lot of factors, so I wanted to cover both approaches in this video. We'll go down here and create a static vertex buffer with the generated circle data, great. Now, the other arrays use a two-buffer VAO, so I'll need to write a function that binds our attributes for an interleaved buffer instead of using two separate attribute buffers. I'll copy-paste the old implementation and modify it. This function only needs to take one buffer as input. The first parts stay the same. Create a vertex array object, enable both attributes, but in this function we only need to bind one buffer. The first attribute binding stays mostly the same, except for these last two parameters. With interleaved data, WebGL can no longer infer what they should be. We have to specify them ourselves. Stride is, loosely speaking, how big each vertex is, or more specifically, how many bytes the input assembler should move from the start of one vertex to the start of the next. In our case, we have five floats per attribute, so five times the size of a float. The second parameter, offset, specifies how far the input assembler needs to move to find the beginning of this particular attribute. For the first property, it's zero, because position happens at the beginning. For the second attribute, the offset is two floats, x and y. To make it a bit more clear, I'll make a comment with the vertex buffer layout, x, y, r, g, b, repeating for each vertex. To get from one vertex to the next, move forward five floats, x, y, r, g, and b. To get to the color, skip two floats, x and y. Cool. Moving back down here, I'll assemble the circle VAO with this new method, and add it to the list of geometry, knowing that the number of vertices should be three for each segment. Refreshing, you can see the circles. They're a bit triangly, so maybe 20 segments is good. Still a bit jagged, so I'll update this to 40. Ah, now we've got some proper circles. Great. Next up, I'll change the paths from straight paths to curved ones. I'll add in a new parameter, force, in the configuration up here, and in the shape down here. Each update, the velocity of the shape should change by the force times the amount of time elapsed. I saved by habit and saw a TypeScript error. Of course, I'm not adding the new force to the shapes in the spawning code. I'll generate a random force in the same way as the velocity. And now you can see that the paths are dynamic and curved. Very nice. The last thing I want to do is to have the spawn point change locations every few seconds. I'll create a spawn position variable with a random value between 10% and 90% across the canvas in each dimension. I'll also add in a tracker variable for how long until the spawner should move, and update it in a similar way to the shape spawn time variable. I'll then set the position of a newly created shape to the spawn position instead of the canvas center. You can see that the spawner is in a random spot, and after 5 seconds, it moves. Fantastic! And we're done. This is the demo I promised to make at the beginning of this tutorial. To close out, I want to reinforce the structure of a WebGL app. All the code up here is setup code and loading code, creating vertex buffers, compiling shaders, getting all the data stuff ready on the GPU for use in rendering. Inside of our render loop, our frame function, we calculate the amount of time that has passed and use it to update our simulation logic. In this case, all the shapes zooming around the screen. Finally, when the simulation is updated, we have some WebGL code to render shapes that represent the simulation state. The rendering code is surprisingly short for how much code is in the demo, and that's by design.
WebGL is super optimized, just like all low-level graphics APIs, for doing as much work as possible upfront so that the per-frame render code can be as fast as absolutely possible. In the next tutorial, we'll be making the jump into 3D. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.